We are joined now by Tim Watts of Bama Online, who has got to feel like he's in another universe. Tim, how strange is it after 15 years of covering Nick Saban, Alabama, to see Kalen DeBoer, Alabama? Like, it's one thing you knew Kalen DeBoer got hired, you saw him recruiting, but to see him on the practice field, to see him at that podium next to that Coke bottle, how weird is all this? Yeah, it's been a week. It's been a, a week of weird. It's almost like that Spider-Man animated show with the universe. I feel like I've uh, I've went into another. I'm in another planet, another universe with how Alabama football was ran at the same time. I mean, it's been so different, and it's not good or bad, but it's definitely different. I mean, we have Charlie Potter who works for me, who's a who's a technician, as professional as it gets. He's excited to go to practice this week because they got like 30 minutes. You know, a lot of schools will go. You only get 30 minutes. Well, Alabama, that is like an extension of life. We went from 10 minutes with, you know, there's a lot of confusion too. On a side note, people were acting like Bama never gave access to practice. They absolutely did. We got, well, they always did, but it was like seven minutes. Seven I've been there for that seven minutes before. And all that stuff, no assistant coaches. And then COVID came and Nick Saban took that, you know, and locked it down and probably rightly so at first. And then it just became a habit. But 30 minutes, that's an extensive amount of time. Travis Ryder, who covers the team for us, flew in, and, you know, everybody was excited. And then you've got the coaches talking, and I have friends who are like, like the funniest thing is I had a friend who texted me. He said, I haven't heard Freddie Roach talk since he's a linebacker in Alabama. And it kind of hit me <laughs> like, you know, like, right, the public doesn't see this. And, and uh, I thought they did good. And another thing is how genuine they were. Cause they weren't polished. You know, it was just like yeah. somebody walking, like somebody walking up to you at Walmart, started interviewing you. Well, that's, that's the funny thing. The freshmen in Alabama who were just recruits and getting interviewed by, you know, the likes of us at on three and everybody else, they're probably more experienced being interviewed than the guys who've been position coaches at Alabama for Absolutely. a while. Uh, speaking of new position coaches, Chris Kapilovic is the, is the new L line coach. I was going to play this just because, it's an Alabama position coach being interviewed. Man, that, that probably started early in North Carolina. We used to have Pound the Rocks, and then we went to Juice Squad. And, you know, it's always good. You know, nobody gives the old lineman any love, right? You know, I always joke, if there's a 40-yard run and the back goes untouched, they say it's a great run, right? But if he gets tackled in the backfield, the old line isn't very good, right? Because you use the other words used for that. So, you know, I, I like to make it fun for the guys. And, you know, we got a Juice Squad. Uh, we'll have hoodies, hats. We even got a a big gold chain with a gold juice squad and they win that line of the week and it's amazing how much they love putting that thing on right so so we promote our guys and and you know when you're in the football culture everybody knows how important they are so the juice squad that's the offensive line so you're going to see in tyler booker and company in in the juice squad hoodies and whoever wins the juice squad award is going to be wearing the big old gold chain Time's it's not nick Saban's right? alabama baby yeah <laughs> What's that song? Times are changing. You know, I think that's it. You know, and the funny thing about it is, and I love Alabama fans, but they will really discuss everything. I mean, we spent a day and a half when they found out practice had music. And you've been at events too, right? You've been at events. You go to an NBA game, yeah. college, there's music playing. When the game starts at a seven on seven, you kind of zone out. You're watching the players. The players certainly aren't running routes and doing spins and Michael Jackson or splits, they're certainly focused on the game. It sort of tones it out, but it does get you pretty hyped before the game. It does get you pretty excited. Then that's why everybody does it. But to have Nick Saban never play music and then to go to music, I think there was a, you know, I think there was a little bit of a shock factor. So we've been debating stuff all week at DevOnline.com and uh, it's good debates. I mean, times definitely are different. It's also March. For sure. Now there's a good basketball team at Alabama too to talk about, but but the music thing. Well, let's set people's mind at ease. Pretty sure Kirby Smart lets them play music at practice at Georgia, and they still win national titles doing that. So it, it is okay. But yeah, I mean everybody plays music now at practice. The the funniest thing about that one, Tim, I remember back when Gary Patterson coached TCU, and this was probably. I want to say like 2015, 2016, I went to a practice and Gary Patterson did play music, but unlike all the other schools where the music is basically the rap that the players like to listen to, that's usually what the, what the music is at most schools. Gary Patterson had his own Gary Patterson playlist, and this was the only thing that was allowed to be played. And it was a lot of like 70s rock. There was a band called Trooper that I had never heard of that apparently... Was, was popular before I was born, but it was 
it was unbelievable. But yeah, I think I think now it's pretty commonplace, and it just yeah, it keeps you going. I it, but the thing about it, you mentioned this earlier. Neither good nor bad, just different. How much are you gonna have to say that to Alabama fans over the next six months? Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, there was heated debates about why recruiting was so quiet during the quiet period. It's literally, <laughs> it's literally called the quiet period. You know, so you got a new staff, late. You know, getting to fill his staff was on down the road, but. Um, so, you know, February was building relationships, putting out offers. You see a consistent amount of offers every night um, that go out. You can count on six to seven, five to six, seven tweets that go out. And um, they were building those relationships. And every bit of effort went towards this first week where I don't know if they had 100, but it felt like 100 kids came on. Big name guys got a commitment from a uh, from an athlete, Zamir Smith, that they really liked, took a you know, a playmaking guy they took, made headway with a lot of other guys. Um, it's just like, you know, like you said, you know, like we've said, it's different. It's not bad. But I get the guys that are old school. I mean, Nick Saban didn't play music because his coaches never played music, probably. That would be my guess. But these kids are growing up where they were allowed to listen to music in the locker room on the field. So it's a little bit different. He kind of uh, uh, changed with the times. But I've never heard anybody say, you know what, we had a championship team, but we kept playing music at practice. And that's how we ended up losing a lot of football games. I don't think anybody's ever going to change that. But I do think the music's important, like your story about Gary Patterson. That described every family trip anybody's ever taken. Where the mom, <laughs> Dad's, Dad's got the radio. <laughs> well, you, mom's even worse now. I came up, I came yeah. up, I grew up, you know, I was in a little bit, a rap was very popular when I was growing up. Different kind, Beastie Boys run DMC. I've always stuck there. Mom goes straight to the 70s, 80s hits. And the kids, you know, I think they like it. Everybody likes it, but they gripe about it because it's tradition. But she well, yeah, was just it, throwing on some Seals and Crofts Summer Breeze. It's, yeah, it's a different. And they always, they don't even hear the song. It's mom. You know what I mean? You didn't even hear it. <laughs> You've heard it in time. Relax, you know? It, it is truly amazing. And and it is funny, though, when you see the, the folks who cover practice don't always, they're not always up on, on the current hip hop. And yeah. so they get a little shocked when that base starts. I, I was like to take you back to central Texas, that same it is actually, I think was the same trip I was on where I, I caught the Gary Patterson playlist. Baylor was playing, you know, it was basically wall to wall future and Migos and then all stuff that was popular at that time. And I was like, the Baptists have really, uh, really changed on their musical tastes here. Yeah, I mean, but again, that's the energy. I just love the fact, you know, again, like you said, it's March. There's not a lot to discuss. But this week we saw a lot of discussion. Now the thing for, for you know, there was a lot of can he recruit the South. And I guess that's a fair statement, right? He's never been in the yeah. South, so you don't know. But asking a question, that don't mean you know the answer. You're going to find that out as time goes on. And he's showing he knows how to recruit. And let's be honest, recruiting is recruiting, right? If you know how to recruit, you can recruit. You build relationships. You sell your program. It's like a single guy. A guy that knows how to get girls can get a girl in Columbia, Venezuela, or Alabama. He knows how to talk. I think Kalen DeBoer and this staff is like that single guy. And in the SEC, they all recruit like single guys, right? I mean, they all know how to sing it. They all know I, how I to hate play. that that's the best analog we can ever come up with, but it's always so true. <laughs> it is. I mean, Kirby Smart knows how to host it first date. You know, Kalen DeBoer does. And, you know, you're in a conference with people who who put a lot of effort. They put so much effort in it. They're banning, you know, cookie cakes. You know what I mean? When you're banning cookie no. cakes, you know. This is where com- they ban cream cheese and now they're banning cookie cakes Man, down right. with the NCAA. Uh, so amazing. you mentioned all the visitors, you know, probably triple digit visitors last week for the first two practices. I am assuming this is going to be a steady stream of guys coming through. How important is it to get people to come look at how a practice looks, how a day in the program feels with this new regime? I imagine that's that's a pretty critical thing for them here in these next few months. Oh, I think for sure. I mean, you build a relationship. When you saw those guys talk, Freddie Roach and Mo Lindquist and, and Shepard, those guys, they all – all the coaches have done extremely well. You can see they've got a good personality. So getting them on the phone and working them, now you got to get them onto campus to see because, hey, Juju Lewis, you know, one of the top quarterbacks in the country came. He's been to Tuscaloosa enough. 
he doesn't he knows his way around that campus but he got to see that offense in action right and the one thing you've heard the most about is that option and then if you talk to Kane Womack and you're a recruit and you're hearing all these different roles and you know terms like stinger and all this stuff husky and all these different positions and how he's going to attack you also want to see it in person so get him on campus is huge because you get them to see what you've been telling them about. So now, you know, is the proof in the pudding? We've been telling you what we're going to do. Now here's what we're doing. Did we lie to you? Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, everybody who's been being recruited by Alabama and, and these class of 2025 guys, a lot of them were coming on campus in the Nick Saban era. We're, we're coming to games in the Nick Saban era. They understood what that was, but now – Kalen DeBoer has to show what this is. And, and it's funny because I read people talking about, oh, well, it, you know, they just give them enough NIL. Look, everybody Alabama recruits against has access to a significant amount of NIL money. So you still have to differentiate yourself in some way. And that's where I, I think it's interesting with these 17, 18 year olds, because when Nick Saban leaves, I feel like that wipes the slate clean. Like you got to prove it all over again. Yeah, and I agree. And I mean, again, you know, that's a that's a good point. Is like, uh, and you know, it also should be noted that everybody Nick Saban likes, Kalen DeBoer staff won't like, and everybody that Kalen DeBoer staff likes, Nick Saban might not have offered. So you're seeing that crossover because you got a dis- different system, you got a different uh, a scheme, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what Alabama does on the offensive line. Washington was considerably lighter. Now they still had big mm-hmm. guys, but they were considerably lighter than Alabama who had two centers in that 350 range, if not more. I mean, two tackles in that 350 range, if not more. So you got to, like, change your philosophy on your recruit for a certain way. But obviously Nick Saban knew what he was doing. I think that's why a lot of the attention you've seen on defensive backs, athletes that can play both ways, wide receivers and those guys. You've seen a lot of the crossover there. But they're evaluating them. You know, you're seeing guys being re-offered and guys not re-offered. So there's a lot lot of recruiting going on. A lot of evaluating going on. Um, just been a very busy time for them, but they seem like they're pretty excited about it. That offensive line thing you mentioned is really interesting. I was at the Senior Bowl when Kalen DeBoer came by, and he got asked about it. And I felt like he answered the question very diplomatically. But if you read between the lines, it is basically no. These guys are going to be lighter. Like they they were they were bigger than I would prefer. And the thing is, you know, everybody's got their own flavor. Like Kirby Smart and Nick Saban love huge offensive linemen. Like if you look at Georgia's starting offensive line, they've got they want tackles who are six eight so they can put three hundred fifty pounds on them. Like they want to be that big. But if you look in the NFL, there aren't many lines that big. Most NFL lines are are smaller, look more like what Kalen DeBoer trotted out at Washington last year, and so it is it is very much a philosophical thing, and you got to figure out what it is you want. Yeah, they're so big that every Georgia and Alabama game, we got the same graphic, right? Look how much bigger they are than your average NFL offensive line. They were absolutely huge. I also saw J.C. Latham was closer to 240 down from that 260, 260 plus range. So he got down a little bit too. Well, 20 pounds is a decent amount of loss to get ready for that NFL combine. So I think he saw that as well. Everybody was talking about how well he moved. But again, you're talking about a philosophy in college versus the future with, uh, um, you know, in the NFL, but with Kalen DeBoer, it's, you know, it's more about his scheme with his offense, a lot of quick passes, a lot of quick hits, guys pulling and moving. You know, the one thing about Coach Cap that when I was talking to people that knew him, they kept talking about vertical blocking, which is basically just get in front of your man and push him back. So, I mean, you're going to have to be athletic, have good feet to, you know, and, you know, be quickness to get out there and move a guy around. Another thing that just hit me and I, it's not new information, but we just we haven't talked about it yet. This is Alabama going from a defensive minded head coach to an offensive minded head coach. Yeah. And it is very like we always said, you know, whether it was Kirby Smart or Jeremy Pruitt or Pete Golding or anybody calling the plays at Alabama, it was Nick Saban's defense. You know, Kevin Steele did not Nick Saban's defense. Now we're probably going to feel the same way about Kalen DeBoer's offense. Meanwhile, Kane Womack's probably like, hey. It's my show. Yeah, I think, you know, the one thing, it's funny you bring that up because I've had people describe, I tell you, I had an SEC coach tell me the thing about Gus Malzahn, who's an offensive-minded coach, and this is pretty common, I think, with offensive-minded coaches. They leave the defense alone. Now, Nick Saban wasn't one, obviously. He's a, obviously a defensive-minded coach. 
But the offensive guys, one of the coaches who had coached with Gus Mazon said, I don't care what you do, but do it fast. Get the ball back. Let them score. I want the ball. That's an offensive-minded coach. So they pretty much recruit who you want. Gus Malzahn, let the defensive guys recruit who they want. Get the guys that fit your scheme. There might be a little of that with Kane Womack because it is his defense, right? It's his defense. It's his personnel. Obviously, there's a trust factor between him and Kalen and DeBoer. And, hey, if you can have somebody handle one side of the ball and you focus on your side, I mean, there's not a better union that you're going to find. Well, and also, I think Kane, having been a head coach these past couple of years, is pretty important because he can kind of operate on his own without a ton of supervision if need be. And, and now we saw, like, Nick Saban would definitely have an influence on the offensive side of the ball in terms of philosophy. And the, the one thing, I, I don't know that we're going to see this at many places again. The one thing I thought was interesting with Nick Saban is offensively they would change coordinators, but they would not change offenses it would it would be kind of the whole menu and then the coordinator would just call their flavor of it but they did that so that the players even if the offensive coordinator changed didn't have to learn a new language and i i do wonder like if you know kane womack has a good couple of years and then becomes an sec head coach is it going to be alabama's defense and then you just sort of work with it or it will it be just what what that new coordinator brings. And and that's, you know, that I, I always thought that was something Nick Saban did extraordinarily well and helped him deal with the constant coordinator changes because every time somebody was good, they became a head coach. But we don't know how this is going to operate now. You have to think though, you've got Mo Lindquist who was a head coach on that staff. You got some defensive mm -hmm. guys. They're all learning the same system under Womack. So you have to think possibly they're teaching those guys to replace Kane Womack if he gets a head coaching job, but you got to think if he does a good job, uh, you know, if he does a good job at Alabama, I think you have to expect him to get a head coaching job considering he has a head coaching experience and some success as a head coach. So could be as simple as teaching those guys this defense and you see that defense run through them. Or like you said, you might bring in a, you know, another defensive coordinator and it changes to what he wants. But the key is to make sure you have the personnel that will transfer over. And I think that's one of the things that you're looking at with Alabama you're looking at traditional defensive linemen. You're looking at really good linebackers they're recruiting. Now, they're a little bit more versatile, Swiss Army knife type guys. Same with the secondary. But these are guys, the question isn't can they be a cornerback. It's are they a cornerback? Are they a safety? Are they a nickel? Are they a slot guy? You know, the, the last commitment, Zamir Smith, was basically referred to as a field corner, somebody that can bounce around almost like a rover in my mind in softball. He can just bounce around where he wants to find mismatches and, you know, turn, uh, you know, take a turnover and turn it into instant offense. So the personnel, just like Saban left it for Kalen DeBoer, I think that Kane Womack will have the right personnel there. If, you know, if that future that happens in the future. So you, you mentioned even the little thing, like, a, like music at practice sends the message boards into a tizzy and, and, and you get debates for a day and a half. How, how nervous is the fan base still about the unknown, the, the newness, the, the how's this all going to look? You know, it'd help if they could remember one year to the next. I mean, that's the thing that's kind of funny <laughs> to me. I mean, seriously, it's like every year it's like Groundhog's year except a day, except for it's for the whole year for us. I mean, after signing day, you know, Wednesday, they have the big meeting. They have the signing day. They meet with the Red Elephant Club. Um you know, we saw uh, a, an offensive coordinator announce he's the offensive coordinator at Alabama and was gone Friday. At that big <laughs> event, that's after that, they take a break. Thursday, Saban gave them Thursday to Tuesday. Well, we had a discussion, and I had several people say, hey, I, holy cow, this is new. Alabama's taking off in February. It was almost like a tiss, tiss, gotcha moment. And I was like, dude, it happened every damn year for 17 years under Nick Saban. And it's just like that practice access. Oh, Kalen DeBoer doesn't take it serious. You have access to practice. Like Charlie Potter is going to influence a game. You know what I mean? But Nick Saban did it as well. So it would really help calm the nerves if they would remember one year to the next. And I'm kidding, but I'm also kind of serious. There's a lot of people. That no, I, I don't. You're yeah. you're not kidding. And, and it is yeah, interesting. And it's also, here's the thing. If they lose two, three games this year, it's going to be the music of practice's fault. It's going to be the access to spring practice. It's going to be the interviewing position coaches. If they, let's say they they have a great season and it looks just like it always did under Nick Saban, it's going to be like, hey, this is great. Yeah. New and different. Viva la difference. Like, it, that's all it'll be. But, 
but you know, Kalen DeBoer is just going to have to rise or fall on his own merit. And you know, it's, I just can't imagine the pressure because, you know, we've talked about what that job is and, and how, how built up those expectations are and nothing short of perfection is going to be good enough. So he's got to, he's got to figure out how he's got to handle when it's not perfect. And God, look, these sec schedules, nobody's going to be perfect. I don't think. Well, you know, the thing about it is I'm not sure he can really win over the the naysayers, so to speak. I mean, if he has success this year, how much is it going to be given to Saban? I imagine by the people that are skeptics that they'll still give the, you know, to Saban. And obviously, obviously Saban left a great roster, but, you know, I refer back to that because I thought, you know, in recruiting that there's people that were convinced he couldn't recruit. So when mm-hmm. he got Ryan Williams, you would have thought, hey, that's a pretty big deal, right? That is a yeah. pretty big deal. Biggest wide receiver since Julio Jones. Maybe the biggest in-state recruit since Julio Jones. a big deal. And they kind of wrote that off. And then he got the other transfers. Well, then he got Keon Saab. And there were still people wondering, can he recruit? And I was like, well, Keon Saab is a national portal entry. He could have went yeah. to a dozen and dozen of school. Now, I will say he got a big advantage when he flipped Antonio Coleman from Auburn. So he grew, he drew some naysayers. I'm, almost, I'm saying that too much. But he drew some doubters. Uh, uh, interest when he did that. So I think it's picking up a little bit, but you're always going to have your doubters. And I mean, it's Nick Saban and, and, and to, to rattle on, this happened with Bear Bryant, right? I remember Saban had won two national championships when the debate started, who's the greatest Alabama coach? And it kept going. I think it's still pretty debated. And it's a good debate. I mean, it's two fantastic coaches in different eras. Yeah, I think that I usually view them differently. I, I will say the, the before I let you go, one other funny thing, we played this clip last week and I laughed so hard the first time I listened to it. The other people who have to be trained, other than the fan base, the reporters who cover the team, yeah. they have to learn you can it's it's okay to ask depth chart yeah. questions. Now, listen, listen no. to the, the the defensiveness in the question and then listen to Kalen DeVore's answer. Now, you talk about depth chart and different stuff. Obviously, I'm not asked for a depth chart, but do you have players. I mean, you sat next to Jalen Miller at the basketball game. Is that your guy going into it, or do you clean slate every year with every position? Yeah, I mean, you want competition, right? And so um, the competition is always going to be there. And yeah, someone had to take the first reps today, you know, with, uh, with uh, the ones uh, when we lined up and we referred to him as that, and Jalen did, you know. so. Um, you know, he's putting everything into it he can, along with the other guys that uh, took those first reps. But I fully expect uh, those guys that are really hungry uh, to be pushing um, those guys that are ahead of them uh, to be their best. And uh, that's what you want in a football program, uh, you know. And that's certainly going to be the case here with so many good football players here uh, wanting to get on the football field. Did you see the small yeah. grin creep across Kalen DeVore's face when the guy goes, I- I'm not asking for a depth chart. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's going to be a lot. I mean, it is a lot to learn. I mean, I was I was surprised all week because somewhere in my mind, I thought the only access to the assistant coaches was Wednesday or Tuesday when they had the media open. But, uh, you know, Friday, Charlie Potter was dropping new interviews. And I was kind of like, what the heck's going on? Then we saw, you know, Coach Cap. And I was like, are they talking to everybody? Like, <laughs> you know, it's chaos. It's out of my hands. It's one of those moments that. <laughs> It's wild, but it was a very interesting week, not just recruiting, but team. And like you said, and, you know, I kind of envisioned like that gate being shut when the media could go in. And when it opened, it's almost like the opening of, uh, of uh, Disneyland. Everybody <laughs> sprinting to the avatar, just right? I right? <laughs> thought everybody was just sprinting to get a good spot in the video and photo. It wasn't that bad. No elbows. But I can imagine how excited they were. I was pretty excited to see it all. Well, it is a brave new world in Tuscaloosa, and we're going to pick apart every little part of it, and I'm going to love it. Tim, thank you so much. Absolutely. Anytime, Andy. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on 3. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the On 3 Sports YouTube channel.